This right here is my Barbenheimer. Margot Robbie's book recommendations versus Killian Murphy's book recommendations. Let the games begin, because my job it's just book. So I've been making this series here on my YouTube channel for a little while now, and I call it my Celebrity Book Club, where essentially I do loads of research into the books that a specific celebrity has read or recommended, and then I psychoanalyze them, pretty much against their will. Um, but I've never put two celebrities head to head before. So here's what happened. Basically, I had planned two separate videos, but then everyone went on strike. So I scrapped both videos in solidarity with the SAG after strikes, but it looks like they have now reached a tentative agreement. So let's make the damn video. So I did my research into books that Margot Robbie has recommended and books that Killian Murphy has recommended. I've put them into these jars. It's kind of giving Cosmo and Wanda, I'm not gonna lie. I read all of these books over the last couple months and I am going to pull one out of the jar for each person and then put them head to head and decide which of the two books I prefer and then we'll have an overall winner of which of these two people has the best taste. This methodology is not scientifically proven, it's not legally binding, it's ultimately unimportant, it's just my <laughs> subjective opinion, but it'll be a good time so cheers to that. And we will see which books are the bomb and which books should have stayed in the box if you know what I'm saying. So let's begin. Firstly, let's pick a book for Margot Robbie. Also, I just have to say that my outfit <laughs> is not supposed to suggest any bias, but the first book is Animals. This is by Emma Jane Unworth. And honestly, this book walked so that Dolly Alderton's Everything I Know About Love could run. It's about these two best friends living in London in their 20s, just causing carnage wherever they go. I think the title comes from the fact that they are essentially like party animals. They live to party, they have petty fights, and the book ultimately explores adult friendships, specifically female friendships. And Margot Robbie basically did this video called In the Library with Chanel, where she talks about these books, and in that video she spoke about the importance of having female friendships represented in literature and on screen, which of course is what Barbie does so well. In her Chanel interview, Margot said this book made her feel so seen, and I totally understand that because Margot Robbie was a South London babe. Honestly, the hot Australian to South London pipeline should be studied by scientists, by biologists. It's like a mass migration. You know how birds migrate from different hemispheres? That's what Australians do. At some point in their life, every hot Australian decides they have to move to Clapham. I don't understand why that happens, but it does. They have this innate instinct, I guess, that is like this magnetism towards Inferno's nightclub in Clapham. That is where you will find all the hot people from Australia in London. Anyway, one of the two friends that we follow gets engaged to a man, but she kind of realizes that she's growing a little bit distant from him, and this also puts a strain on her friendship. We sort of just follow the two girls day to day as they get into various scrapes. There's lots of fun little anecdotes. I felt like the characters were really fleshed out and you really believe in their friendship, which is so important to me. I think a lot of books take for granted that they've said they're friends, so we'll just agree with you. But we have to actually see the friendship to be really rooting for them, and in this book we definitely do. And so you actually feel their anxieties. This feels like a very anxious book about, you know, being in your 20s is the trenches, but it's also a lot of fun, and so that's what this book kind of represents. Now, for a recommendation from Killian Murphy, and that is, oh no, <laughs> Grief is the Thing with Feathers. Wow, very different books. This is Grief is the Thing with Feathers by Max Porter. Killian said, this is one of the most moving books I've read in recent years, it investigates a father's suspended state of unexpected loss and grief with a gorgeously wry sense of humor. Captivating, poetic, and surprising. And truly, this does what it says on the tin. This is a book about grief. It takes its title from the Emily Dickinson poem, Hope is the Thing with Feathers, in what is essentially the most depressing remix of all time. And grief is depicted as a crow. Now, interestingly, Killian Murphy and the author Max Porter actually adapted this to the stage, in which Killian played both the father and the crow. And he said it was the most satisfying and exhausting experience of his life. He says, being up there, playing dad and crow, going through that cycle of grief every night was emotionally and physically draining and he said he couldn't actually sleep while he was on the stage like while he was performing each night when he would go home he really really struggled to get to sleep at night because of how emotionally taxing and emotionally draining this experience was and I think that's what you need to know about how gut-wrenchingly sad this is it's kind of written like poetry and it's stunning it's funny at times but it also rips your heart out and out of these two books this is really tough. But I think the one that left the biggest impression on me was Grief is the Thing with Feathers. So one point to Killian. Now back to the jar. Next book we have is Dune. My sworn enemy, Dune. We meet again. <laughs> it's well known on this channel that I 
hate this book. Honestly, me and Frank Herbert, one on one, get us in the ring, I'll fight. Let's scrap. I know that this opinion makes a lot of people very angry because this is held as like the gold standard of its genre, but I would like to remind you that we are arguing here about a book that is all about magical sand. The book jumps in with the most absurd world building on the very first page that I've ever seen, and it just says, I don't know, you work out, I guess. The characters are one dimensional, even the plot isn't good because it's spoiled at every section by this princess who's having these kind of premonitions, I guess, about what will happen. So you're basically told at the beginning of every chapter what the twist is going to be. That's horrible storytelling. I will die on this hill. I'm sure the movie is great, but for me, this is gonna be the easiest battle ever. So let's see <laughs> who's winning. We have The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Ta-da, the first of two Hemingway books that we're gonna be seeing in this video. You know what I realized when I was making the cards for this jar? Weird fact for you. Every single word in this title has three letters, The Old Man and the Sea. That's odd. And honestly, this book reads like a fever dream. That's the only way I know how to describe it. It's kind of like Moby Dick, but without the whale encyclopedic knowledge. It's about a Cuban man who feels very disillusioned with life. He heads out on his boat and he becomes embroiled in a battle with a fish, but like a giant fish right? It's a big ass fish. And in the process of chasing this fish, trying to capture this fish, he has these kind of, this like dreamlike stream of consciousness about the state of the world and the process of aging and his life. And this battle at sea that he goes through kind of reflects the battle of his life, which has its ups and downs too. And Killian says of this book, it's always the beautiful simplicity of this story that transports me. And I agree wholeheartedly, like this book does more in that many pages than this book manages to do in that many pages. To me, there is no competition here. It's the old man in the sea every time. And so that's two points now to Killian. Two nil, come on, Margot, let's see. Okay, we need a good one. One just fell out, so I guess it's that one. This is one for the money. This is a book that is definitely of its time, shall we say. It follows a woman called Stephanie who has just lost her job and needs to make money quickly. And so she becomes a bounty hunter. And frankly, she is rubbish at it. Let me tell you one thing about Stephanie. She is going to mess up any task she is given. You give her a task and she is going to fuck it up and make things so much worse. And she's also gonna make it everyone's problem. She messes up at literally every turn. And the joke of the book is kind of like, look at this woman entering a man's world and just completely being terrible at it. Like people literally get shot because of how incompetent Stephanie is. This woman is a bumbling idiot. And the man that she is hunting down coincidentally is the man she lost her virginity to at age 16. And she hit him with his car for not texting her back. Which of course begs the question, who is the actual criminal here? <laughs> I think it's a fun book, and I definitely think it needs to be understood in the context of the time that it was written, where the character is the heroine based purely on the fact that she kind of flips gender expectations, but I do think that it's feminism that we've kind of moved on from, if that makes sense. So that is one for the money. Let's dive back in here and grab one of these. Shy. This is another book by Max Porter, and it sits somewhere between prose and poetry. Oh, I see this quote that I underlined here. You can't trust anyone. That's why he loves the music so much. It promises and it delivers. He's secure in the sound, alone in his headphones. No barrier, no game. It welcomes him in. There really is this lyricism to this book. It follows a young guy who has been expelled from multiple schools and so he's at this last chance school. Basically, it's like a rehabilitation center for troubled young people. And we meet him when he is standing on the water's edge. You know, he's about to jump into a pond with a backpack full of stones. And as he prepares to sink, he is contemplating his life. And it's a lyrical study of troubled youth and the burdens of being a teenager and the story of his life kind of flickers past him in a series of vignettes which we slowly build up into this mosaic of his life. And we start to slowly understand him. I thought this was heartfelt and impactful and a bold writing style that is anything but shy. But for me, I found that its fragmentation wasn't as effective as it could have been. And overall, I didn't feel massively connected to this character. So I don't think it was as shattering as it could have been. So this is a really tough battle. This book is really fun, but very frustrating. This book kind of hurt my heart a little bit. I think I'm gonna have to give it to Shy. That is 3-0 to Killian. Wow. And actually the themes of this video bring me to the perfect opportunity to talk about BetterHelp who have kindly collaborated with me on this video. So this next part of the video is a paid partnership with BetterHelp because if there is something that is interfering with your happiness and preventing you from being the best version of yourself and achieving your goals, you might want to consider online therapy which can help you to approach life in a different way. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easy because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you to a credentialed therapist 
therapist in as little as a few days. BetterHelp's mission is to help make finding a therapist accessible. And this is a very important mission and very, very appreciated because finding the perfect therapist for you can be really hard. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There is a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com slash Edwards. And clicking that link will actually get you 10% off your first month at BetterHelp. So you can connect with your therapist and see if it helps you. And I think it's really important to note that finding your perfect therapist is a little bit like dating where you kind of have to test it out. And if someone isn't the right match for you, then you can easily switch to a different therapist. Online therapy for me has given me a soundboard and a safe space to help me feel like I'm back in control of my life and my feelings and my thoughts, which is so important to feel like you again. So if you are struggling, then consider online therapy with BetterHelp and you can click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash Edwards. Thank you again to BetterHelp for supporting this video. Margot, come on, we gotta bring this back. Okay, we have The Hobbit. Margot said this was the first book she could remember reading. She read a segment at school and then ran home and had to finish the rest of it. She borrowed her sister's copy. And this is an undeniable classic. It's the prequel to The Lord of the Rings, but I would argue better than The Lord of the Rings. Please don't come for me. You know, my favorite fact about J.R.R. Tolkien is that he used to work for the dictionary. And so, and when he worked for the dictionary, they were compiling all of the words that begin with the letter W. And so a lot of the words in the OED that we still use the definitions for today were written by Tolkien. So for example, the word walrus, the definition of walrus was written by the same guy who wrote The Lord of the Rings. Isn't that cool? Anyway, this book is as iconic as the letter W. It's hard to even review because even if you subjectively hated reading it, you cannot argue its objective impact and influence on the book industry and the fantasy genre. It's also an epic saga with really complex and intricate world building. In case you are Patrick Stark, you have been living under an actual rock. In this book, we follow a hobbit called Bilbo Baggins who embarks on a journey with 12 dwarves to recover their stolen treasure, which is being guarded by a dragon. Then on this expedition, Bilbo Baggins finds a magical ring, which renders the wearer invisible. And honestly, it's a banger. So let's see what that is going head to head with. It is Appointment in Samara. This is Killian's recommendation. It has a great title, which takes its name from an Arabic fable. And as he's walking through the market, he sees death and he's like, oh my gosh, like this, I don't want to die today. So he flees Baghdad and goes to hide in Samara. Now the merchant's boss meets up with death and is like, dude, why did you scare? my employee, that's so annoying. And Death is like, no, no, I was just as startled to see him too because I have an appointment with him in Samara later on. So that's the epigraph that the book begins with. And then the actual book is kind of like a reality TV show in a novel. Basically, we observe the residents of this town where a guy called Julian has thrown a drink in the face of another man so hard that their ice cubes gave him a black eye. Like, that's some that's a strong throw. It's actually pretty impressive. But anyway, we follow his life over the next couple days and see the decline and fall of Julian. It's about personal destruction that just keeps spiraling further and further like a train that is just out of control. That's just getting faster and faster and you know it's going to crash eventually. The book has a very unique authorial tone and it's kind of fun to get caught up in the gossip and the drama of this small town. And I know this book is also highly celebrated because it was one of the first books to quite openly discuss sex and also sexual desire. This is what Killian had to say about it. It is a book about sex, alcohol, class, and dreamers. Devastating in its conclusion, it completely drew me into the atmosphere and pressure of what it must have been like to be alive in America at the time. All details are present, the cocktails, the cars, and this book, most overwhelmingly, the unhappiness. But when it comes to these two books, of course, I am going to have to go with The Hobbit. It's just so magnificent. The world building is incredible. I do really love this book. So that's testament to how good this one is. So Killian 3, Margot 1. It's not too late to bring it back. This is To Kill a Mockingbird. All of these bookshelves, and for the life of me, I cannot find my copy of this book. I don't know what happened to it. But fun fact, Margot's dog is actually named Boo Radley after a character in this book. And she said it was one of the only books from school that she remembers absolutely loving. And it's definitely a book that is studied pretty universally because it is so textured and rich and fascinating and thought provoking, but also captivating. It's one of those books which are studied in school, but also really hook you as a reader. And I think being like academically studied and really good for escapism as well, is a rare combination, but it is a page turner. It's a story about the harsh reality of human behavior. It's about kindness, but it's also about pain and cruelty. And basically a black man has been falsely accused of sexually abusing a white woman. And so the aim of the book is to talk about tolerance and race and injustice, specifically racial injustice. And it is beautifully written, very, very powerful, but it is not without its flaws. I think that the trouble with this book is that it does perpetuate a kind of white savior image because we essentially follow a white family 
Molly, who are given way more depth than any of the black characters, so I do think that they should be taken with a pinch of salt. But the prose is stunning. Now let's see what book Killian is having. Eclipse. So this is by John Banville. I love this cover. And that's kind of where <laughs> the things that I loved stopped. <laughs> I definitely want to give this author, John Banfield, another shot because I feel like maybe this just wasn't the book for me, but I could definitely see the potential of his writing. Basically, this is the portrait of a man kind of wandering around his childhood home, which is very dilapidated and run down, and he is recalling memories from his life. It's poetically written, which you know I love, but almost so poetically written that it's actually hard to fully comprehend and understand. A lot of it for me didn't really make sense. Like, it's the kind of book that makes you feel stupid as a reader and I don't want a book to intellectually bully me all the time. Sometimes I'm just not in the mood to feel like I have zero brain cells and I guess at some point you have to ask yourself if it's so impossible to follow is it actually well written or is it just a little bit pretentious you know? I can appreciate it as a work of art and from an objective perspective but from a subjective perspective and my reader response my reader experience I found this one a real slog. It was not a fun time like I was going around my house putting up missing poster signs for the plot of this Look, is the plot in the room with us? Like, where did it go? <laughs> what happened to the plot? So when it comes down to this book or To Kill a Mockingbird, it's gonna be To Kill a Mockingbird every day of the week. So that is now Margot 2, Killian 3. The next book for Margot is The Sun Also Rises. We're back to Hemingway. So Margot said in her Chanel interview that she tries to read books about the places that she travels to, and this was an example. That's definitely something that I have been consciously trying to do in recent years as well. You get such an insight into the culture, the food, the lifestyle of a city, of actually living in the city, like the lived local experience of that place, rather than just the kind of touristic abridged version that you are getting by being on holiday there. And so I love to do that, and Margaret said she went backpacking at age 18 to Spain and went to see the running of the balls, which is what this book speaks about. Most of what this book contains is the characters drinking and also just flirting with each other. That's 90% of this book. If you read a Hemingway novel, you have to prepare yourself for like very little action, but a lot of really intense, <laughs> detailed, unnecessary descriptions. And also a lot of people just sort of sitting around talking to each other. I do think you have to be in the right headspace to read one of these books. Uh, otherwise they might just be a little bit dull. And I appreciate that doesn't really sell it, but I did enjoy reading this book. We basically follow these young, hot people in Paris and then Spain in what I can only describe as the ultimate novel about being friend zoned. And what Hemingway did really excel at was detail. I thought it was okay, but it's not my favorite Hemingway. I really love The Old Man in the Sea. Now, let's see. We have small things like these. Ah, another excuse for me to talk about how fantastic this book is. Thank you, Killian, for making this happen to me. I am a Claire Keegan stan. I, this was the first book I read this year and I just devoured it. Claire Keegan is one of my new favorite writers. I will read her shopping list. She writes these gorgeous, understated, minimalistic novels, which pack such a powerful punch. They really build up to this moment. And this book is about a little town in Ireland preparing for Christmas and a man called Bob Furlong who starts to realize that the local convent in the town is treating spoiled women, AKA women who have had a baby out of wedlock. They are treating these women really cruelly, really heartlessly. It's horrible. And the more I think about this book, the more it means to me, the more impressed I am by it. It brings attention to this part of Irish history in such a beautiful, exquisite way. It's smart, it's thoughtful, I am in awe of Claire Keegan. And the best news ever is that this is being made into a movie with Killian Murphy playing Bob Furlong. That is my Joker right there, that is my Barbie. So it was gonna take a lot to beat Hemingway, but small things like these definitely is the book for the job. And so this is another point to Killian, which I think makes it four, two. And we only have one book left for each person. So we do have a winner, but I do wanna see who would win this final round. So we have The Secret Seven for Margot Robbie. And let me just tell you, this book is my jam. Spread this on a piece of toast, because this is my jam. The Secret Seven made me who I am today. I am not kidding, I am not being dramatic, that's the cold hard truth. The Secret Seven was a genuine paradigm shift in my life. Like I genuinely think I might categorize my life in the same way that you know like AD and BC represent the birth of Christ. My life is AD and BSS before Secret Seven. I don't even remember their names. I don't remember any details about these books. I just remember loving them as a kid. I just remember the feeling and it was joy, it was euphoria. These books were my crack, aged eight. And we basically follow these seven sleuthing friends who solve mysteries and do so excellently. Enid Blyton did what she needed to do, rent was due and she paid it. She came into the publishing house offices and said, I wanna make history. 
And that's what this is. I am basing this on pure nostalgia <laughs> and nothing more thoughtful than that. But The Secret Seven is going up against Rabbit Run. This is a book by John Updike and this is an absolute romp and a ride and so provocative. John Updike wrote about sex in an extremely explicit way and that's kind of what he is known for especially with this series of books. Because trust me, our character is breeding like a rabbit. And this is about a character who is so unlikable, he makes Professor Umbridge look like Ron Weasley. He's an ex-professional basketball player trying to adapt to a normal life again, but he is selfish, he's rude, he's basically a spoiled brat, and I could not stand him. But that is the sign of great writing, to make you literally make your blood boil over a character. He bursts off the page. And it's an interesting study, I think, on how we naturally want to root for the protagonist just because we are seeing things from their perspective. Like we always want to give them the benefit of the doubt. But this really tests you. I mean, he ditches his pregnant wife, moves like 10 blocks down the road because he needs some space. And then he shacks up with someone who is essentially kind of like a retired prostitute. And he just treats her horribly too. He is a nasty guy. We see his true colors and they are horrendous. They're like muddy brown. This man is a loser but it's a great read. It is really fun. However, when it comes down to this or The Secret Seven, I am gonna have to give it to The Secret Seven based on pure nostalgia. I love those books. I forgot to do a kind of like summary, but I think what we can definitely conclude here is that Margot Robbie's taste in literature is much more kind of like high concept, high stakes, high levels of drama and world building. My dog has come to say hello. <laughs> hey! Whereas the books Killian recommended were much more domestic, they were more about family politics and the life in a small town. They're these kind of deep, intense character studies. And I definitely think in general, I do gravitate more towards the kinds of books that Killian was recommending. So I think that is why he won for me personally, but I know that not everyone would agree with that. But this was really, really interesting and definitely a really diverse range of books too, which were really fun to kind of explore and think about and especially to put them head to head. And who knows, if different combinations had come out of those jars, maybe the result would be different. I, I don't know, it was genuinely very close. And so that ends the video on four points to Killian and three points to Margot. So in this instance, I do prefer Killian Murphy's book recommendations, but both were great. And I thoroughly enjoyed making this video and I hope you enjoyed watching it. So thank you so, so much for watching. Have a wonderful day. All the best, stay in touch. Subscribe if you're new down there. I think the button is somewhere down there. And I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.